morning. morning. And welcome to the Unitarian Universalist Congregation at Shelter Rock. I'm the Reverend Natalie Fenimore, and I am one of your ministers here at Shelter Rock, along with the Reverends Ned White and Jennifer Brower. I want to welcome all of you to our congregation today, and especially our newcomers. We hope you have a good experience with us here today, and if you're interested in more information about our congregation, please complete the blue newcomer card, which you'll see in the pocket of the pews, or go to our welcome area in the front in the lobby and place the blue cards when you get them in the collection basket, and we'll be able to send you more information about our congregation. As many of you may know, Shelter Rock is a very big and lively place with many opportunities for growth and learning, fellowship, and fun. And um, I don't want us to just take that fun thing lightly. <laughs> fun is a very serious business. We have often lives that don't allow us enough time for fun, enough time to just fill ourselves with the joy of living. And one thing that we have here when we choose to be together is that we choose to open our lives, ourselves, our hearts, our minds open to one another. We are here to be enriched by the coming together of all of our differences, all of our diversity, all of our experience. This opportunity to share of our lives with one another is a rare and precious thing. I think we should be very careful of it. We should really shape it and hold it and understand it as something glorious for us to be. So, take advantage of those opportunities. Know that this place was built for fun. Right? <laughs> and I've been here long enough to know that we don't always do that, but I'm asking us to know that it was built for fun, for joy, for love. Today is the last day of donations for our annual school supplies drive. We have been asked to bring backpacks and school supplies for children in need. I want to tell you as I think I do every year, how much I love backpack buying and school supply buying. As a person who no longer lives with little kids on a day-to-day -day basis, the opportunity to walk down that aisle and remember how glorious it was to be a child with your first backpack or to give a child their first backpack, how wonderful it was to look at all the colors in the crayon box, how great it was to imagine what it was going to be like to learn something new. How wonderful it was to think, I'm gonna be in a class and they're gonna be new kids. Which way is the bus gonna go this year? What's my teacher gonna be like? Just remember all of that, that gift. And when you buy a backpack and school supplies and put them in the bin in the lobby, you, are bringing that excitement, that joy, that wonder, and easing a little of that anxiety for a child who's going off to school. So please, if you have not yet done so, bring your backpack. If you miss today, we can stretch it till next week for you. So please, please, please. Also, it's time to register now for Beloved Conversations Retreat and Small Group Discussion. Even though the program won't start until November, we need to get a count, if that's possible. Beloved Conversations is a UUA curriculum uh, meditating on race and ethnicity. It's going to be started at the UU Fellowship in Huntington. So if you'd like to register, please look at the flyer in the lobby table for detailed information about how to register. Also, next week, our guest minister will be the Reverend Laura Kim Joyner, talking about the reverence for life. After that worship service, there'll be a wild walk with directors of One Earth Conservation, which is the Reverend Laura Kim Joyner and our UUCSR member, Gail Colon. They're gonna meet at 115 in the Beach 
um, lobby and they'll be going through the trails in our woods. And if you haven't done that, it's a wonderful thing to do. We don't just have this building. We have 100 glorious wooded acres where you can go and interact with nature and find that for some people, that's a wonderful way for them to connect to the spirit. So please, if you are able, with long pants, join that walk. I am pleased, very pleased, that our guest minister today is uh, Sherry Halliday Kwan. Sherry is a candidate for the Unitarian Universalist Ministry, a recent graduate of Union Theological Seminary and the Youth Ministry Coordinator at First Unitarian in Brooklyn. Next year, she'll serve as a student minister at the First Unitarian Universalist Society of San Francisco and continue her work with the steering committee of the Asian Pacific Islander Caucus of the Diverse and Revolutionary Unitarian Universalist Multicultural Ministries, which is an organization for Unitarian Universalists of color. So I'm sure that you will enjoy Sherry's words today, and you'll have an opportunity to meet with her after the service in the reception line. And now, as is our custom, please greet your neighbor. Whoever you are, whomever you love, 
Wherever you are on your life's journey, you are welcome here. Come in, sit a while. Be surrounded by the light and stillness of this place. Draw close to its people. Come in, light a candle, sing, share laughter and peace and fun. Find courage and comfort here. In this hour, may each of us be reminded of life's highest callings and most simple blessings. The flaming chalice is the central symbol of our Unitarian Universalist faith, and we join now with other congregations who are lighting it at this very same moment, youth groups beginning their meetings, people lighting it alongside their hospital bed, or maybe at home, thinking, seeking the warmth of the flame and community. May the light we now kindle draw us closer to the community that awaits us. May it shine upon the faces of those gathered and guide our way forward. Please rise in body or in spirit and join me in singing our opening hymn, number 357 in your gray hymnal, Bright Morning Stars. I invite you to join in our words and song of affirmation, which are printed in your order of service. Please remain standing. <clears throat> Love is the doctrine of this congregation. The quest of truth is its sacrament, and service is its prayer. To dwell together in peace, to seek knowledge in freedom, to serve in the community. This do we affirm
Fathers is a very blessed congregation in many ways. And this is our opportunity to share our gratitude and our largest with those who have less. We invite you to join this morning in our offering. Will the ushers please come forward? Our reading today is by El Munsif El Wahhabi. It's called The Desert. In the beginning, the desert was the ashes of a woman inhabited by a storm. Hidden secrets echoed, and the silent poet lay down on its grasses alone, or sat between its light and shade, looking for something that had disappeared in its endless, rust-colored mirrors. At the beginning, the language of the desert was grass blooming against the wall of wind, tall palms swaying in the season of seeding, and cinders carried by air to the blue welcome of warm sand. She was our first fountain, our mother, who held us and then gave us away to the age of waiting cities.
I invite anyone who would like to light candles of joy or sorrow to come forward now in this moment of silence. hearts and minds are full. Let us sit for a moment in the light of these candles of our joys and sorrows, memories and hopes. hold in our hearts today UUCSR member Marianne Zapula and her son Gary Jacobelli. Gary has been injured in an accident and will require some time recovering uh, the injury to his arm and hand and we hold them in our hearts as Gary recovers. And today we celebrate with our members, Jim and Lynn Smith, who have come upon their 40th wedding anniversary, probably quite by surprise to themselves. <laughs> and as we breathe together, it is our hope and our prayer that we be lights to one another, that we be sources of strength and support, that we may be sources of comfort and care, that we may be sources of beauty for one another, as you will see in our congregational art show. 
May we find here together what we need to nourish us. For we are, as humans, hungry people. Hunger not only for food, for water, for light. We are hungry for one another. We are hungry for the love and joy which only we can bring to one another. This place, this time, is for feasting. Feasting on the joy and love and comfort and strength that we bring here for one another. So let us feast. Let us take in that joy and comfort as if it were food that we could taste, as if it were that ripe summer peach that you've been waiting for, that perfect tomato that you've been watching ripen and you hope you'll pick it at just the right moment. You know what it's going to taste like and you've been waiting. And when you taste it and have it, you know that you are full. So may it be when we are together. All this week we've been waiting for this moment to be here together, watching ourselves grow and change and ripen in living. And now, here we are, ready to share ourselves, ready to feast upon one another. May it be so.
Before you sit down, what were some of those words in English? Oh, uh, La Golondrina is a, a song written by a, a, a Mexican expat that was in France and he was missing his country. So he wrote a song, La Golondrina is a swallow. Yeah. So, Adonira, Veloci Fatigada, uh, where are you going uh, in such a hurry and so tired? La Golondrina, de que se va y sin el viento se ha extraviada. Like, where is she going? She's so tired. She's looking for cover, but she's not going to find it. Uh, junto a mi lecho, or you can say pecho. Lecho is a, like a bed. Pecho is your chest. Junto a mi lecho, le pondré su nido. So uh, by my bed or by my chest, I will put her little, her little nest. And uh, donde pueda la estación pasar, where she can spend her time and rest. Uh, también yo estoy en la región perdida. O cielo santo y si y sin poder volver, uh, vol volar. También yo estoy en la región perdida. Uh, uh, so am I lost. Uh, I'm, I'm in a lost region. Y, uh, o cielo santo y sin poder volar. It's, I, I'm stuck here. I can't, I can't fly. So in the rest of the song, it's just like, more big melancholy. <laughs> yeah. Hope you guys enjoyed it. Where are you going? She is so tired. Thank you for choosing that song. A few weeks ago, I joined Unitarian Universalist clergy in an interfaith contingent in the deserts of Arizona. We had gone down there at the request of an organization called No More Deaths, No Mas Muertes. Uh, they sprung up about 15 years ago when migrants started crossing the desert in higher numbers because their economic situation or violence in their home countries drove them to seek a place where there was some glimmer of hope. And as Border Patrol concentrated enforcement in the cities along the Mexican border, people were driven out into the deserts, about 100 miles of expanse without human settlement, without access to water, without access to roads, mostly crossed on foot. And it's a dangerous journey. It's a journey that not everyone makes through. And so for the last 15 years, organizations like No More Deaths or various groups that call themselves Samaritans in these border towns, they drop water and food and medical supplies in the desert. One volunteer there said, this isn't the type of work for someone who likes to fix things. It's not the type of work for someone who likes solutions because we come here because it seems like the most natural thing to do when somebody needs help. We come here to drop water because people are thirsty. 
We come here because people are driven into the desert and don't have water and they're thirsty. And so we carry bottles of water and we drop it there. And then law enforcement ups what they do. They come and they slash the bottles or they remove them or they pour the water out and they make it harder for people to get the water. And so we step up what we do and we drop more water. So it's not a type of thing for anyone who wants an end. It's only the type of work for somebody who is willing to respond in this very immediate way. And when he said this, as we were walking in the desert, another UU minister near me, she visibly recoiled. She didn't say anything in response to this man at the time, this man who every day manages to get up and drop water in the desert. But you could tell that she didn't like it. She didn't want this to be the only solution. Her father had gotten on a plane and come to this country. My father had gotten on a plane and come to this country. That is one thing that is available to people. And if dropping water is not a work for a fixer, she thought, well, that is actually a solution that is available. That is something that is in the realm of possibilities, even if it's not a political reality right now. But so we were there because these people who drop water for a Sunday a month or every day if they can, or maybe when they get a chance on their spring break, a lot of these people have been criminalized, have been told that the work that they're doing is trespassing and littering or aiding and abetting people who are hoping themselves to break the law. And so they're being stopped from doing this humanitarian work. And they asked clergy to come, people who could come with our collars or our kippahs or some demonstration of authority and power someone who could come and say we are doing good in the world, and that maybe we would either be able to drop water, or that if we were stopped doing it, could lend a voice to their cause. So they asked us to come, and I with 60 something other people, 60 being a number that was important to this group, because that's the number of migrants that they've found this year who have died in this corridor. 60 of us, Unitarian Universalists and Christians and Jews mostly, joined to drop water for one day, just one small area of the desert where these volunteers hadn't been going because they couldn't afford to get their permits revoked. They dropped water in lots of different places. And this one particular place that was, for whatever reason, a focus of law enforcement, they hadn't been going to. So they asked us to come and we came and those of us who had come from all other parts of the country who were not used to the dry desert climate, who thought 105 seemed plenty hot enough, and so when they told us it would probably go up to 117, were really nervous about the risk that we were taking, both in terms of would we get arrested, or would we get heat exhaustion? Would we be stopped from doing this work by law enforcement? We were nervous. But we joined them for one day. We got up at like five in the morning. I got up at four, which I'm not a morning person, but I have to admit, though I'm not someone who generally feels fear, I was nervous. I was nervous about what it would be to go with this group of people into a climate that we were not used to. Nervous about how heavy the water would be and nervous about what might happen. I woke up a little early. But at 5.30, we packed our bags full of a couple of gallons of water each that we would drop, plus the water that we would carry for ourselves, and walked out into the desert. And we split into a couple of different groups because that's a lot of weight. Each of those gallons costs about, costs, it costs about 60 cents, actually, uh, weighs about eight pounds. And, you know, that's a physical load that not everyone was prepared to take on. And so we split into two groups, one that would travel about three miles, one that would walk in a long line and flood the desert with a body of clergy and lay people, people who were here to demonstrate that people of faith cared about this cause. We walked into the desert with our stuff with our snacks, with the breakfast that volunteers had packed, 
Many of us had gone to REI or Macy's or wherever it is that people shop, which let's be clear is probably online, I'm just pretending like people actually go to stores, to prepare for the journey. People had boots on, people had hats. We were as well prepared as people could possibly be. And we were going out into the desert for three hours. Not very long, four, five. As it turned out, we were out there for about six, but we were prepared for three and looked like we were about to climb Mount Everest. It is something to walk around in 117 degree heat with a bunch of rabbis. I will tell you this story that they've been telling for many, many thousands of years about wandering in the desert <laughs> takes on new meaning when you're actually doing it. <laughs> One of them who was standing alongside me just goes, was not speaking to me, I am pretty clear, though I had tried to be a little bit chatty because that's who I am and it was hot and we were thirsty and this person didn't want to talk to me but was talking all the same. Kept saying, Moshe, which Moses, I get it now. I get why you kicked the rock. <laughs> it is something to be walking around in that sort of heat and understand what it's like to not know who's out here helping you, who's out here hunting you. Three hours doesn't tell you what 40 years is like. Three hours doesn't tell you what it's like to not be here because somebody asked you to and you saw that some of your friends on Facebook were doing it and you thought it would be a good thing to do, but you're gonna get on a plane and come back to New York afterward. Three hours doesn't prepare you for what it's like to leave a shelter at the Mexican border with nothing but the backpack and enough food to last maybe two days, in a journey that will take you over a week if you don't get too lost, to set out with not enough water, because it is physically impossible to carry enough water to cross the desert from the Mexican border to the towns south of Tucson. It doesn't prepare you to know what that is like. But still we went. We walked our mile and a half, and we took the water out of our bags. We dropped it in a couple of different places, at a well where people could see from a distance and would often come to, hoping that there might be some drop of emergency supplies, but knowing also that law enforcement would likely also know that there were supplies there and that we would need to perhaps put them in different places because these particular bottles were likely to get slashed or poured out or removed. And so we dropped our water in a few different places. And on our way home, some in our group, that fear that they had of heat exhaustion came true to a certain extent. They found that they couldn't walk as easily as they might have wished. They found that despite all of the warnings to drink enough water and to take it easy, that sometimes our bodies betray us that sometimes we think we can do things or want to do things that, as it turns out, we won't be able to do, at least not in that moment. I learned that a talit, a Jewish prayer shawl, makes a really good sunshade for someone who can't walk any further. And I learned that if you are a clergy person, if you are someone from New York or Los Angeles or Chicago with a big network and American citizenship, and Border Patrol happens to find out that maybe you need help, they will come get you. Whether you want them to or not, they will drive to you and pick you up and put you in a truck and make sure that you get to safety. That's not the case with the families who call saying, my father or my son or my sister is left in the desert and is lost. They won't send an emergency rescue party in that case, but for the rabbi in the desert, they will. And we came back and a woman spoke at a reception, an Aho Samaritan, a woman from the organization that we were working with who lived right on the desert and talked a lot about how the desert was a place of beauty and wonder. It was the place where she and her friends went for dinner parties, 
where they went to harvest prickly pear fruit to make juice each summer, where they went to feast to taste life's fruits and sweetness. And I was filled with rage and confusion. I love the desert. I think it's an incredibly beautiful place. And as we were walking there, walking through there, it was clear that this was a place that brought death and destruction and disappearance. It was not a place of beauty, or if it was, it was also a place that was hostile to human thriving and survival. And so to hear her talk about it as this place of, of fun and relaxation and lovely evenings, I couldn't wrap my mind around it. I left for a moment just to get a drink of water and get my bearings. And when I returned, there was another speaker, someone who's from the area, who is half Navajo and half Mexican, though his mother crossed the border, but not before the border crossed her family. His family had lived in the same area for centuries and <clears throat> eventually did cross over into the American side, but in a place that she had spent most of her childhood. This man who had himself had a mother who crossed the desert, had had many of his family members cross the desert in order to come to where we were standing on the American side of the border. He wept at the words of the volunteer who spoke before him. He wept when he heard that she could see the beauty here in the desert. Wept because he too knew that beauty. And he knew also the terror and the hostility of the desert. And he made clear for me the thing that I couldn't understand 30 minutes before, the thing that filled me with rage and confusion. He said, as it turned out, the same thing that the other volunteer had said about the ways that we move back and forth and don't fix things, the ways law enforcement moves and the humanitarian volunteers move. He said, it's not the desert that kills people. The desert is dry, the desert is harsh, the desert does not have water, but the desert doesn't demand that we spend over a week or a month wandering around it. The desert is there for us to visit, to be in, to take nourishment from, but it's not the desert that keeps people there and subjected to its hostility. He made clear for me that there were bars in that sandstone cliff that I hadn't seen before. Later that week, we went to see some of the criminal proceedings for people who are, before they are deported, are charged with a criminal misdemeanor and then a felony for crossing the border. And in the Arizona courtrooms, there, that same sandstone that's in the cliffs and in the mountains is brought into the courtroom. It's actually a really beautiful architecture, and they bring out large pieces of it behind so that as the eight defendants are lined up and each go down the line and hear their charges, it's given to them in Spanish, which many of them speak as a second language because they speak an indigenous language first, and respond, cuprabre, guilty, eight in a row, they look at this sandstone that was the same as the sandstone in the desert. I looked at one of my new rabbi friends who was sketching the courtroom, and those bars in the desert that I hadn't yet seen were also there in her picture. Those slabs of sandstone were also the same face of the criminal justice system, that each of these people about to be deported would spend between a month and three months in prison before going back to their country or the country that they were desperately leaving in search of safety and a living. And those bars were embedded into the sandstone, but not the sandstone itself. So the desert, it's this place that is the central story, the location of wandering for not just the Jewish people, but many religions. In Islam and Christianity, the desert is also a place of struggle 
and of encountering God, right? Of encountering that which is most holy. In their 40 years, quite early on, if the timeline fits what's in the Hebrew Bible, God actually reveals God's self to the Hebrew people, and it's awful. They say, never again. They cry, and they wail, and they scream, and they say, that's it, never again. That cannot happen, because the face of God is too terrifying, too scary. It's a place of beauty and wonder and transformation that is not easy, right? That's the desert as it's created. There are other dangers in it, Will law enforcement come after me and my group? Will I be able to get water, even though there are water drops here? Will I be able to access them? Will I be able to get food, even though there are people along the way who are willing to give me food? So the desert has risks, but each of those risks is not inherent to the desert at all, right? The desert here in New York, here in Manhasset, it looks a little different. It's hard to talk about 117 degree weather when we're all weirdly on this August day a little bit chilly here in this room, right? Uh, but you've got, you've got sand here. You've got a small desert here in your building. Every week you wait and you gather here. You gather to be with each other, to be in the face of your joys and sorrows and hopes and dreams. To come light a candle or carry those within yourself, but to be together in this very small desert, this very small expanse. Now, the desert as a spiritual theme often means for us the places where we feel most alone, the places where we don't know what is next, the places where God or the universe will speak to us, and we don't particularly want that, let's be clear. I think the desert for us also exists in that gap between the life that we most want to live, the life that flows from our deepest values, and a life that's guided and dictated by Fears that it turns out are not really fears. One can get heat exhaustion and be rescued. A life that's guided by consumerism and bigotry and, and individualism that tells us that even as there are others who also have joys and sorrows, we feel alone, All right? That gap between the life that we most want to lead, the life that we most want to live, and just moving through in the space that we are, confused and concerned and scared of fears that aren't actually going to happen. Now, some of us are thrust into the desert. Some of us are thrust into that space where we feel alone, where the dark night of the soul is what guides our every day. Loss or grief or a society that tells you that you are not worthwhile. These are things that drive us into those moments, and it's not a choice. It's not a choice to be in that moment for those people who are there on those border towns in a shelter with a child, wondering what next to do. Some people go into that desert because they are there, and it's the only move in front of them. But for those of us who are a bit distant from it, who are scattered in other places, whose lives look like they will look as we expect them to, tomorrow and the day after, and probably next week, we get to choose whether or not to step into the desert. We get to choose whether or not we sit in that small space, that space of joys and sorrows, that space of our hopes and our dreams. We get to walk out prepared, but less prepared than we think we would be. When I think of what the desert looks like for me, it's leaning into risks and a life that is not comfortable. 
It is making choices that seem like the ones that nobody would make because they don't seem sensible. As if a sensible life was actually what we were created for. As if a sensible life was what we have worked our lives for. There are moments where stability and continuing to put one step in front of the other are what our life affords us. But for many of us, and especially those who are thrust into the desert, the only option available to us, the only way to really live, is to move through that dryness, to move through those fears, to know that you are not alone in it, to go out and to find that when you are there, as it turns out, I don't know where you are going. You are tired. But there are also prickly pear harvests and feasts and dinner parties to be had and people who will be there when you need them to be. May it be so. Amen. Please rise in body or in spirit and join me in singing our closing hymn. It's number, it's in the teal hymnal, number, let's see, I think it's 1008, when our heart is in a holy place. I want to make sure to thank the Reverend Dr. Natalie Fenimore for inviting me here today. Thank you, Reverend Natalie and Carol, for leading worship with me. Thank you, Brace and Christian, for your ministry of music. Thanks to Pat and the ushers, and to all of you who do this unsung work of making worship happen each Sunday. And that means all of you. Thank you for worshiping with me. We depart today with words from the Reverend Wayne Arneson. Take courage, friends. The way is often hard, the path is never clear, and the stakes are very high. Take courage, for deep down there is another truth. You are not alone. 
We extinguish this chalice with the knowledge that those of us gathered here today keep a spark alive within us as we go out into the world. May we carry this flame with love, compassion, and hope. Go in peace. Amen. Before you go, I would like to make a special announcement, an invitation to all of you to attend the Congregational Art Show. The reception will be in the gallery at 1 p.m. Thank you. <laughs>